In 1978, at age 27, Dr. Sebak was introduced to vitreous by André Balash in Columbia University, New York. This extraordinary structure became his life's fascination. Five years later, he was the youngest person to have ever been awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship, which is typically given to established elderly university professors. As he told me, this experience provided his insight into basic science and how it can improve clinical care. From 1984 and 86, he learned retina from Dr. Charles Kappens at Harvard University, who taught him the importance of details and perseverance in the face of hardship, not only in medical life, but also in personal life. Dr. Skeppens, and I think also Dr. Meyer Schwickerath, firmly believed in his visions, even when the others did not share or disagreed. Jerry says he has passed his knowledge on to many students. As professor of clinical ophthalmology, Doheny Eye Institute in Los Angeles, Dr. Sebak has written <clears throat> numerous peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and books, and continues to do so. In 2014, Professor Sebak published a more than 900-page book on vitreous, the vitreous in health and disease, where I had the honor to be a co-editor. Interesting that a structure which is 98% of water can contain so much information. Dr. Sebak is now a senior research scientist at Duhini Eye Institute, UCLA, and since 2019, Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology, Jeffen School of Medicine. He is also the director of the Vitra Macular Retina Institute in Huntington Beach, California. Besides science, he enjoys life with his brilliant wife, Jackie, and their children and seven grandchildren. Among many honorary lectures he has given worldwide, in 2019, Dr. Sebak delivered the inaugural Robert Machimer Lecture to SOE, the European Society of Ophthalmology. While he considers this a great milestone in his career, he feels equally honored to have been selected for this year's Meyer Schwickerwart Lecture to the DOC, entitled Vitreous and the Lens, A Tale of Two Media. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear colleagues, meine lieben Kolleginnen und Kollegen, may I present to you my dear friend and colleague, Professor Jerry Sebag. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I'd like to also thank the program committee for um, selecting me to present the Meyer Schwickerath Lecture of 2023. It's a particular honor because Meyer Schwickerath was a remarkable individual. His fame began in 1945, shortly following a solar eclipse, which induced retinal scarring in some of his patients. And it gave him the idea that one could use this source, this energy source, to purposely create retinal scars, reattaching retina, and treating other retinal conditions. So in 1949, he developed a system of mirrors that was used to focus sunlight in the operating room onto the retina and create retinal scars as part of the uh, operation. By the 1950s, this was replaced by a xenon arc manufactured by Zeiss, and then later, this led to the uh, development and application of lasers in ophthalmology. As a result, Meyer Schwickerath uh, has won many awards and honorary doctorates uh, and prizes from various societies, but perhaps most notably, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize three times. I'm also honored to follow in the footsteps of many luminaries who have delivered this lecture in past years, and I'd like to particularly thank Suzanne Binder, who was instrumental in my being here today. 
The relationship between vitreous and the lens begins in embryology. Blood vessels arising from the hyaloid artery and uh, branching into the vasa hyaloidea propria anastomose with the tunica vasculosa lentis. And this is necessary to uh, provide nutrition to the developing lens uh, in utero. Remarkably, by the end of the second trimester, all of these blood vessels disappear. There are secrets that nature has built into that phenomenon that can help us treat neovascularization both in metastatic uh, carcinomas, but also within the eye. And we performed a proteomics profile analysis of the cytokine changes that occur during the second trimester of uh, human embryogenesis. And I think therein lie many secrets and perhaps future therapeutics that will enable us to manage these neovascular diseases better. There is incomplete regression of the fetal vasculature of the vitreous. Uh, many of those conditions are benign, such as Mittendorf's dot and Bergmeister's papilla, but sometimes PHPV, persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous, can be the result of this incomplete regression of the fetal vasculature of the vitreous. But I submit for your consideration that myopic vitreopathy might be another manifestation of remnants of the fetal vasculature that create problems later in life, which we'll consider later in this lecture. Vitreous is very important in maintaining lens transparency. And David Beebe was the pioneer of this philosophy and I very much like the quote when he was um, um, stated that lens is an unusual structure in an unusual environment. It's unusual structure because of its low oxidative metabolism, but it's also in a low oxygen environment, that being the vitreous body. And that is necessary in, to, in order to promote the maintenance of the highly ordered molecular arrangement within the lens, and that's shown here on transmission electron microscopy. However, when there's increased vitreous oxygen, this results in increased reactive oxygen species, which promote cross-linking and opacification of the lens. So the vitreous is replete with antioxidants that inhibit this cross-linking and contribute to the transparency of the lens. Vitreous degeneration, however, results in loss of the antioxidant protection provided by the vitreous to the lens. And I came across a very interesting study in preparation for this lecture of 87 eyes and 61 dogs who were evaluated by ultrasonography and the degree of vitreous degeneration was classified from zero to three on the basis of ultrasonography. These dogs were followed for four years, which is the equivalent of 20 plus human years and the incidence of cataract development was noted. Grade zero only had cataract formation in 10% of cases, but by the time it got to grade three, 83% of these dogs developed cataracts. And that's highly suggestive that the vitreous is responsible for maintaining transparency of the lens and therefore degeneration of the vitreous results in loss of this maintenance function and the development of uh, cataracts. This diagram shows the many antioxidants that are present within the vitreous body. I think perhaps one of the most important ones is ascorbate, vitamin C. And so I was extremely interested in coming across this study that was actually performed at USC in Los Angeles, where degradation of vitamin C with an enzyme called ascorbate oxidates was known to increase oxygen tension within the um, experimental setup. The graph on the right shows uh, the black curve that uh, represents the oxygen tension within a vial of water over a six hour period of time. The red curve represents the vitreous, and so you can see that there is much lower oxygen tension because of the antioxidants that uh, exist within the vitreous body. The blue curve in the middle is vitreous treated with ascorbate oxidates to break down vitamin C and the loss of that antioxidant potential makes their curve much more similar to water than untreated vitreous. 
Nancy Holocamp, who is a disciple of David Beebe, has done a lot of work showing that posterior vitreous detachment results in increased levels of PO2 in the vitreous body. And we know from Einar Stephenson's work with uh, vitrectomy and oxygen metabolism within the eye that there's increased PO2 following vitrectomy. So the hypothesis that results from all of this information is that if vitrectomy causes an increase in the oxygen levels within the vitreous and that promotes cataract formation, would it be possible to have less cataract formation if we do less vitrectomy? We tested this hypothesis. Could you advance to the next slide, please? This is the rationale for the hypothesis when an extensive vitrectomy is performed, inducing a PVD and removing as much vitreous as possible, the PO2 levels right behind the lens are increased by 300%. Whereas a limited vitrectomy where no PVD is induced and three or four millimeters of gel vitreous is left intact behind the lens, there's only a 50% increase in PO2 levels within the vitreous body. We tested this hypothesis in a model of vitreous floaters. Patients with vitreous floaters have had fibrous degeneration that induces vision-degrading myodysopsia. The panel on the left shows the changes in vitreous structure from childhood, where the collagen fibrils are separated by the hyaluronin molecules to minimize light scattering and maximize transparency. But by middle age, there's reorganization of these molecules, and fibers appear that have an antero-posterior orientation coursing from the vitreous base all the way to the posterior vitreous cortex. By old age, as shown in the bottom two uh, images, these fibers become thickened and tortuous and are associated with pockets of liquefied vitreous. All of these changes result in densities within the center of the vitreous body that can be identified with ultrasonography. And both of these changes, those uh, inside the vitreous body, but also weakening at the vitreoretinal interface, result in a posterior vitreous detachment. Once again, identifiable by ultrasound here in the upper right, but also by OCT if the posterior vitreous is sufficiently close to the retina. And I'm very grateful to Carl Glittenberg and Suzanne Binder for this image because I use it very often in many of uh, my presentations. In addition to the high density of collagen within the posterior vitreous cortex, once it separates away from the retina, the outer layer of the vitreous body is forced to occupy a surface area that is smaller than what it used to occupy when it was attached to the retina. And that induces folds, which can stimulate multiple scattering and interfere with photon transmission to the retina and the phenomenon of floaters results. Next slide, please. The opacities within the central vitreous body, as well as the posterior vitreous cortex and Weiss's ring, can induce symptomatic floaters. But the question is whether these are a nuisance or a disease. If you ask the patients, it's clearly a disease, because they would be willing to accept a 7% risk of blindness and would be willing to exchange one year for every decade of remaining life simply to be rid of their floaters. Yet doctors consider, most doctors consider floaters just a nuisance. And the question is, why is that? I believe it's because of the absence of objective metrics of vitreous structure and visual function, which would enable us to diagnose this as a disease and characterize its severity as mild, moderate, or severe. So we've spent the last decade or so of effort in trying to develop these metrics of vitreous and vision that would enable us to make the diagnosis of what we call vision-degrading myodysopsia. I'll be the first to admit that that's not an easy title. That's not an easy name to, to state. But in a way, that's purposeful because vision-degrading myodysopsia sounds much more like a disease than floaters which had the connotation of something not very serious. And yet, we have to be serious about this phenomenon if we're going to manage our patients appropriately. And we used uh, 
quantitative ultrasonography in order to evaluate vitreous structure. And rather than rely on visual acuity, which is usually quite normal in these patients, we measure contrast sensitivity because that is impacted significantly, as you'll shortly see. This graph shows the relationship between contrast sensitivity, which is on the x-axis, and quantitative ultrasonography, which is on the y-axis. We employ the Freiburg Acuity Contrast Test, developed by Michael Bach at the University of Freiburg, where the Weber index reflects contrast sensitivity. The higher the number, the worse the contrast sensitivity. And so what this graph shows is that the greater the vitreous density on the y-axis, the worse the contrast sensitivity. Armed with these ways to evaluate patients, we can discuss therapy. And our treatment of choice is limited vitrectomy, defined as the use of 25-gauge sutureless vitrectomy. And we purposely do not induce a PVD intraoperatively if the patient doesn't have one preoperatively. And that's so as to mitigate against cataract formation as well as retinal tears and detachments. As I mentioned, we leave three or four millimeters of gel vitreous intact behind the lens to harbor the antioxidants that will mitigate against the changes that we described earlier that induce a loss of transparency and cataract formation. Our first test of this hypothesis was a head-to-head -head comparison with extensive vitrectomy as performed at the University of Amsterdam and limited vitrectomy as we perform it. Recall that there's a 300% increase in PO2 levels following extensive vitrectomy, where surgical PVD is induced and as much of the vitreous is removed as possible, compared to only 50% following a limited vitrectomy. With a mean follow-up of 20 months, and with pre-op visual acuity being uh, uh, equivalent in both uh, groups, meaning that the degree of cataract was approximately the same, Furthermore, limited vitrectomy patients were older than the group that underwent extensive vitrectomy. This Kaplan-Meier curve shows that following extensive vitrectomy, more patients developed cataracts and required cataract surgery than following limited vitrectomy, and it occurred about five months earlier than following limited vitrectomy. In a series of 278 cases that underwent limited vitrectomy with a mean follow-up of 39 months, the complications are listed for you here, but the most relevant to our discussion today is that cataract surgery was only required in 14.9% of cases. This occurred an average of 13 months after the limited vitrectomy, and the mean age of this patient group was 63. No one under the age of 54 has required cataract surgery following limited vitrectomy. This graph shows the improvement in contrast sensitivity following limited vitrectomy. As compared to 70 age match controls, there was a 91% degradation in contrast sensitivity in 139 patients complaining of severe floaters. One week after limited vitrectomy, every single case had normal contrast sensitivity, and that was sustained for months and years thereafter. So in conclusion, patients with vision-degrading myodysopsia have greater vitreous equidensity and more degradation in contrast sensitivity than controls. Limited vitrectomy reduces vitreous equidensity and improves contrast sensitivity in all patients, even those with multifocal IOLs. And I submit for the consideration of the cataract surgeons in the audience who have unhappy patients with multifocal IOLs that an ultrasound might be a very useful thing to characterize vitreous structure, and that vitrectomy might be a much easier operation, especially a limited vitrectomy, as opposed to an IOL exchange. Thus, limited vitrectomy is a clinically proven cure for vision-degrading myodysopsia, which is safe, certainly safe enough, if we're to fulfill the mission of modern medicine, which is to help people die young as late in life as possible. Thank you.